folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from our top secret research facility with another Watchmen video broadcast, the first Watchmen broadcast of the year 2015. Now I've got some things to show you. You know, we find out from the Bible in Deuteronomy 28 that God said that he was going to send a nation against his people, against, he's going to send a nation down here from the far places of the earth. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. And he said it's going to be a nation of fierce countenance. Think of these evil gods and demons and devils, carvings that you see all over the place. And then he said, not only are there going to be a nation of fierce countenance, a people of fierce countenance, Daniel talked about a king of fierce countenance. So this king of fierce countenance and this nation of fierce countenance coming together in the last days. But he said that they would speak a language that nobody would understand. Now, it occurred to me one day, you know, dogs and cats and birds and dolphins and whales, they all have their own language. No human can really understand what they're saying. So I think there's a connection there with the fact that these devils are spiritual realm beasts. But also, the language of symbols. I have done a lot of research on symbols. I think I'm not done doing research on symbols, but symbols just sort of capture my mind. When I see something, when I see a symbol, when I see a logo or something like that, I'm wanting to know what that means. The first time that I ever really looked into something like this was I saw the Triketra on the front of this new King James Version of the Bible, and I went, I've never seen that before. What does that mean? It's the Triketra. It's got little, three little mandorlas, three little almonds on it. Now I wanted to know what it meant. Um, Thomas Nelson Publishers, the people who put out the New King James Bible, they, they had to explain it because apparently it was just kind of like weird for people to look at it. Thomas Nelson said, um, uh, this symbol, the Triketra, is an ancient symbol and it signifies us the unity of the Trinity, the Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So it's a symbol that means the Trinity. But then you read in the book of Acts, where Paul is teaching us and he's telling us, well, not think that the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, can be graven with art and man's device. So God said, there is no symbol for the Trinity. Man doesn't come up with some artwork that depicts the Trinity. God said, no, the Godhead. Man, Thomas Nelson says, this represents the Trinity. And so I'm going, who do I believe? And I think I should believe God. God is the one telling me that this symbol on this Bible does not mean what they say it means. It must mean something else. So I wanted to know what it meant. Began to doing some research on it. This symbol here that I'm going to show you, that we're going to talk about in the next, I don't know, Watchman or two, something like that, has always captured, has captured a lot of people's imagination, and they associate it with a certain thing. Take a look at it. Some of you might recognize this symbol immediately. Uh, some will want to say this is the caduceus. Actually, this one isn't the caduceus. The caduceus has two serpents on it. This is the rod of Asclepius. I did this much research on who Asclepius was. He's some sort of god of something, all right? But anyway, so those of you who work in some sort of medical profession or, let's say, lawyers would recognize this symbol on the back of uh, ambulances. That's a joke. Don't sue me over it. Uh, but we see this and we associate this symbol and the caduceus uh, with a symbol representing health or medical aid of some kind or some sort of medical arts the process of trying to keep us humans from dying. That's what we associate this symbol with. We think it's a symbol of health. But I want us to look at it for a minute. Here we have uh, on the left side, this is the symbol commonly used on ambulances here in America. Um, we have a cross. We have a rod. I want you to think about that. And we have a serpent wrapped around this rod. You say, wait a minute. I've seen this story in the Bible. Yeah, we're going to cover it here in a little bit. There are other versions of this that you'll see over here on the right. You'll see, again, a rod. There's actually two versions here. You see like a staff or a rod or a stick with a serpent around it. A wand or a scepter. A scepter is something a king holds. Think about it. It's actually, when you just take time to look at these things 
and then go to the Bible and go flip through your mind and that Bible verse is coming out, you're going, wait a minute, this is kind of, that looks like a scepter or a rod. It's got a serpent on it. I wonder what that means. From Genesis, from Genesis chapter 3, the first time we're introduced to the serpent in the, in the Bible, we find this in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So right here, we know that we're dealing with something that's very, very subtle, and it's associated with the serpent. And I don't care what side of the Bible you look at, whether the Old Testament, the New Testament, or all the beef in between here, you're never going to find out that the serpent is A-OK -okay for us, that it's a good thing. In fact, we're going to find out that it's not. So what we're going to do we're going to break down this symbol. We're going to understand what it means. We're going to understand why there's a serpent here. We're going to try to understand the meaning of a rod or a staff or a wand that a magician would hold or a scepter that a king would have. You could probably go through in your mind and go through all of human history. And usually if it's a monarch or a king or some sort of emperor somewhere, they're always given a staff or a scepter, and what does the scepter do? It's just a rod, it's just a scepter. But what does that scepter represent? It represents authority. Think of what this then represents, and we'll find that out here in a little bit. So with everything, we always go to the Bible, we're gonna look at what the Bible says about the rod, how the, how, how the Bible defines for us and interprets for us the language of symbolism. I, um, as I said before, symbols seem to have their language of their own, and some would say, well, I think it means this, and some would say, I think it means that, and there usually is a lot of confusion regarding symbols. Albert Pike, the grandfather of American Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, basically said, when we show you a symbol in Masonry, we lied. We didn't tell you, we told you what we wanted you to know, but us here at the top, we lied to you. We deliberately misled you. If you want to know the true meaning of what our symbols are, you got to climb the ladder like everybody else does. And then if we figure out we can trust you, we're probably going to lie to you again until we can figure out that we can really, 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 really trust you and to make sure that you're sold out to the devil no matter what. Then they might tell you. But I think most of people who studied the occult, who learn things about Lucifer and follow and worship Lucifer, I think also those people are misled too. Reading books um, on Freemasonry, reading books on Rosicrucianism, um, that's easy for you to say, Rosicrucianism and different things in the occult, I found out that most of those writers are either misled themselves or they are deliberately misleading others. Because the only true source of knowledge, understanding, wisdom, if it's a secret, there's only one place in the entire world that you're going to find the key that unlocks that secret. It's not in the inner depths of my soul. It's not on a mountain somewhere. It's right here in the pages of our King James Bible. So I want you to uh, just sort of go through in your mind places in the Bible where you see a rod or scriptures where a rod is mentioned, or a staff, or a, a scepter of some kind, or especially the idea of a rod and a serpent. There's actually, there's actually more than one story about this. Let's look at one of them in Exodus chapter 4. You probably remember this one. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. Think about that. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And we, we in case you don't know, here's what this story, in case you haven't seen the movie, the Ten Commandments. Here's what this is all about. God was ready to deliver Israel. He's ready to bring them out of bondage. And he raised up Moses. Moses has been out in the wilderness for 40 years. He's now 80 years old. He sees the burning bush, but the bush is not consumed. He takes his shoes off. He's on holy ground, and the Lord is talking to him. He's going to call him to go to his people. 
Moses asked the question, Lord, how are they going to believe me? How is it that Pharaoh of Egypt is going to take somebody who is an outcast of Egypt? If you remember, Moses had murdered an Egyptian and he was cast out for 40 years. How is he going to believe me? And God said, I'm going to give you signs. And here's the first sign that we're going to give. You take that rod that is in your hand and cast it to the ground. And Moses did that. Now Moses, pick it up by the tail. Now, you ask me to do that. I don't know about that because I don't pick up serpents, number one. Number two, I definitely wouldn't take one up by the tail. I'm never afraid of the tail of the serpent. I'm afraid of the mouth of the serpent. There's a good lesson in that. We'll get to that maybe a little bit later on, all right? But so Moses does. He obeys God and he reaches down, picks it up by the tail, and sure enough, it turns into a rod again. And God said, this is how we're going to get them, Moses. So get ready because I'm going to send you and Aaron into Egypt. You're going to talk to Pharaoh, and we're going to see if Pharaoh will let my people go. So, in Exodus chapter 7, here's what happened. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. We're going to talk about that later. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And again, if you have seen... Uh, Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner in this scene in uh, Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, you kind of get an idea of what this is. Every time I read this, this is what I'm thinking. Charlton Heston and, and uh, Yul Brynner as, as Pharaoh. But anyway, I love this story, especially as it's written in the King James Bible, because there's a phrase here. And I remember reading this one time and I went, no, it couldn't be. I want you to understand a little bit about typology and prophetic typology, how God shows us what's going to happen in the future by revealing to us what has happened in the past. He, Solomon wrote about this in Ecclesiastes, that which was is that which shall be. Um, the, this wind goes in circuits, it starts here and comes back around again, the sun does the same thing, the water does that, rivers run into the sea, the sea's not full and it starts all over again. And so he's telling us there are cycles. What has happened then is going to happen again. This story, this story is a prophecy. And I want you to understand, we'll get into this a little bit later on. I keep telling you that. So you'll kind of listen in. But we're going to understand something about this serpent and how this rod becomes a serpent and how it's a sign of God. If you remember something that Jesus said before John 3, 16, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that is, of course, speaking of a different story, but I want you to understand a little bit about it now. This rod is going to be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll see it in a little bit. But he's cast down to the ground. Think of Christ coming the first time, and then it becomes a serpent. Think of Christ. Uh, the book of Colossians tells us that, um, that Christ defeated the, and and um, he defeated all of his enemies on the cross because he made a show of them openly. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I had to deal with this one time when I was trying to understand this. Is, are you saying, God, that Jesus is the devil? He's the serpent? No, 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 no. But remember who the devil is. Remember who that serpent is. He's the deceiver that brought what into the world? Sin. The Bible says God made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. So watch this now. And to me, the language of the King James Bible nails it. Let's go back and read part of this again. Here's, here's Aaron. He cast his rod down. Think of Christ coming the first time, and it turns into the form and the fashion of sin, the serpent, all right? Pharaoh and his magicians do the same thing. They're going, well, that's no big deal. So they cast their, their rods down. They become serpents. And God is just going, 
Boy, I'm glad they did that. This is going to be a lot of fun. And we find out here, let's read this again. Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. There's a couple places in the Bible where this phrase swallow up or swallowed up appears. One of them is in Jonah. The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. You see, there it is again. There's another one. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 deals with um, the translation, the resurrection, how that we are like a seed, we're planted into the ground. When we die, we are buried in the ground, we're planted. And the resurrection is like that plant that comes up out of that seed. The plant doesn't look anything like the seed that went in there. You think about that. There's more glory going to come out of this body one of these days than there is in this body right now. I can tell you that for true, all right? But anyway, 1 Corinthians 15 is an amazing, amazing chapter, and it's full of doctrine and pictures and symbols and, th and explanations of those. And here's what it says, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Think of Christ on the cross, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Think of Christ now defeating his enemies in his death, death being swallowed up in victory. When Christ died, that wasn't defeat. That was victory. That was victory for us. That was victory for God. It was victory for Christ when he died. Think of Samson. Did, did we think of Samson as a failure when he takes the two pillars of the temple of Dagon with literally death reigning over him. You have the five lords of the Philistines over Samson's head. And he takes those pillars and brings them down. And he says, let me die with the Philistines. And the Bible says he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did with his life. We don't say, oh, what a failure. He didn't come out of that alive. Oh, no, he's a hero. And so is Jesus Christ. The way he died and defeated our enemies on the cross, literally, death was swallowed up in victory. So he Think of these serpents as death. And we'll sh I'll show you the Bible that says that in a minute. Think of these serpents as death. Think of Aaron's rod taking on the form of the serpent and swallowing up all of his enemies right there in front of Pharaoh. I, I love that. I love that story, all right? So we see here that the serpent represents death. Hebrews 2, 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now take a look at these symbols again. We have the rod of Asclepius. We have the caduceus, the double serpents on the rod and the wings. And we look at that and the world wants us to believe now that these are symbols of life and health and medicine and everything. I don't think so. Not according to what we're going to find out from the script, what we've already seen. The serpent's an image of death. And you would say, well, didn't Moses? Hang on. We'll get there in a minute. And I'm going to show you from the Bible, all right? So is this symbol a symbol for health and vitality and life and maybe even immortality so that we never die? Or is it, in fact, a symbol, a very subtle symbol for death? Think of how this symbol is used. It's used in the medical profession, both of them, interchangeably. It's used in the medical profession. It's used on um, products you see in the store. I'm thinking of one right now. I won't mention it. But there's a product. You'll go into the grocery store. You go into the pharmacy area and finding health products everywhere, and you might see this symbol on there. there I think that they're trying to convince us that there is something healthy about this serpent or these serpents and this rod that rises up in the midst of them. I think it's a setup. I think the language of the symbols will teach us that as we understand these symbols from the scriptures. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 14. Let's get some more understanding about this symbol. The symbol of the rod. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Here we have a story. We have the symbol of the rod. It's in Moses' hand. This is the same rod that he used in Egypt. It's, it's the rod of God, he calls it earlier on. This is the rod of God. He stretched it out over the sea. The sea parted uh, asunder. The Israelites drug, walked across on dry ground. Pharaoh said, works for them. It's going to work for me. And God led Pharaoh into a trap, didn't he? And sure enough, the waters came crashing down and destroyed Pharaoh. Here is God using the rod to destroy the powers of death once again. You see, what we're going to see from the Bible, there's actually like a dual meaning with this rod. There's actually, there's a good rod and there's a bad rod. We're trying to understand the good rod first, because I think if we understand Christ and who He is, what He does, how He works, then it's easy to kind of flip that upside down and see Antichrist. Rather than the Son of Righteousness arising with healing in His wings, I mean, take a look at this caduceus again. It's got wings on it, doesn't it? What does that tell you? In the language of symbolism, if it has wings, that means it's up here. That means it's a spirit or probably some sort of fallen angel. In Exodus chapter 17, here it is again. I like this story. I like this one when I saw one day what it meant. I'll show it to you. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. You ever wonder about the, what's Okay, what's up with the... The rod and the hands, why is it that if the hands are up, God prevails, and if the hands are down, Amalek prevails. I want you to think of Amalek. Amalek is the enemy of God's people. He's the, in, he's the enemy of God. He's the enemy of God's people. So Amalek would represent Satan. He would represent the Antichrist. He would represent, watch this now, your real enemies, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's your enemies right there. What makes them our enemies? The law of God. God wrote these Ten Commandments and He said, do these and live. And we said, okay. And we don't do them. We pretend we do. We try to make everybody think we do. Some people just deliberately lie. That's breaking one of those commandments, isn't it? But the true fact of it is, we haven't kept the law. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. We've already broken them. And once we break them, what has to be done? Somebody's got to pay the price for us transgressing transgressing against God's commandments, against God's laws. It's clearly simple that grace is what saves us and not keeping of the law. So what does this all mean here? So he's got the rod of God in his hand. When he can hold it up, um, God prevails. Lift it. Remember the rod being lifted up. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Boy, I love that. You just think about it. You start taking these symbols, these visual stories that the Bible's telling you, and then apply them to the rest of the Scripture. God will bless you. You'll, you'll, just, you'll understand things better than the greatest theological minds ever existed if you'll just simply believe that every word of God is pure in this book. So, as long as he holds the rod up, his hands in the air... Israel prevails, but he gets tired, he lowers his hand, and Amalek prevails. What is it about Moses not being able to keep his arms up, and why does that work so well? In verse 12, I want you to look at this. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands the one on the one side 
and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You're going to like this, okay? So I want you to think about it. Moses always represents the law. Jesus represents the new covenant, the new law, the new, in fact, even a new set of commandments, which really aren't new because the old commandments were actually based on these new commandments. Let me help you with something while I'm teaching this, all right? There will be people who will approach you who will try to show you passages in the Scripture from the New Testament, from the four Gospels, from Jesus' lips saying, you have to keep the law, you have to keep my laws. They will use that to try to convince you that you need to be Torah observant. You can't eat any unclean thing. You must go to all the Jewish feasts. You must hold them. You must do these. You must do that. You must do all these kinds of things in order to really be special with God. They're lying through their teeth. You know what Jesus said? Pretty much nails it for me. He said, as I have kept my Father's commandments, so you keep my commandments. You know what that means? Jesus kept the law. In fact, he was the only one that ever has. If anybody qualifies for pleasing God through the law and through law keeping, it would be Jesus Christ, but it would be nobody else because nobody has ever kept the law. So Jesus puts a difference here, and he says, As I have kept my Father's commandments, so you keep my commandments. And he gives two new commandments. I'll show you that in a minute. But here we have Moses, here we have Jesus. Paul taught us about this in Romans. He, he says it in Galatians, in the book of Hebrews. Go read it so you can understand it. So you know that I'm not lying to you. Because he said the law was weak. The law is weak. Why is the law weak? Because the law never could make anybody perfect. Let me ask you a question. Speed limit signs along the highways. Whatever country you're in, I guarantee you there's a speed limit sign somewhere. Does that speed limit sign with, let's say it's 65 miles an hour. A lot of interstates in America, 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour in Oklahoma and other places. Does that sign ever make everybody obey the speed limit? No. Mm -mm. Some people look at the sign, realize that they're in hurry, in a hurry, and they think, well, the speed limit's 70. I need to get there quicker, so I'm going to do 75 or I'm going to do 80. This, the law doesn't make anybody keep the law. It just tells you this is the rule, this is the law, Here's the punishment if you break the law, and there always is consequences for breaking the law. So the law was weak. The law cannot hold itself up. Moses is the law. He's the representation of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. It's, the law is weak because it operates through weak flesh. My body, these, my hands, my eyes, my ears, my taste buds, my, my bowels, as the Bible calls it. That's where all my yearnings are. My flesh is weak and so is yours. God said, don't do this. And our, our spirit is willing to do it. But our flesh says, sorry, it's not your day, spirit. I can't do that. Our flesh is weak. It cannot, that's why the law is weak. That's why Moses is weak. That's why he has to sit down. And something else has to hold his hands up. I want to show you something. The law is always uh, shown in the Bible by the way of commandments. How many of them were there? Ten. Okay. And it actually says that the tablets that Moses came down with, there was two of them. Five laws on one, five laws on the other. And so watch this. Here's, here's the law right here. here. Moses is making the symbol of the law with his hands. And that rod there in his hands. You're going to like this. All right? And remember, Aaron and Hur have to hold his hands up 
so that God's people can prevail. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I don't know if you get it. Here's Moses. And he's showing you the, the number of the law, the Ten Commandments. And he's got the rod in his hand, but he can't keep it up. And see, the truth of it is, you and I, we can be good for a little while, can't we? Sure we can. We just don't know how to keep it up, do we? And always, in us, even as born-again Christians, we fail. Hands come down. Amalek prevails. But then we kind of get right with God and, and yeah, God, I'm going to do right. And, and now Israel's prevailing. It looks good. But then the flesh is weak again. So watch this. Moses needed two to hang the law on so that it could be sustained. You see, I agree. I agree that Jesus didn't come to just completely wipe away the law so that you and I could do whatever we wanted to do. That's not right, is it? No, huh? it's not. But he basically said, that here's the law. If you look at the examine the law, the Ten Commandments, yep, they're divided up that way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then there's another one. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two, Aaron and Hur, holding up Moses' hands with five fingers apiece, five laws apiece, the Ten Commandments. On these two hang all the law. I absolutely love that. Now the rod is, is there and it's being lifted up. And now the law is being fulfilled. And you and I have the ability with our spirit to number one, why should we do these laws? Because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, and our soul. And number two, why should you not co uh, commit adultery or bear false witness or covet or, or kill? Why should you not do that? Because you love your neighbor as yourself. And if you'll just keep those two commandments, on those two hang all the law. Everything that God had in the Old Testament are in two commandments now. Jesus has the power because he's the rod that's lifted up. Boy, I love this. I absolutely love this. All right, so the rod uh, of Christ, uh, it represents Christ. It represents uh, death and the power over death. We mentioned earlier that rods represent um, like power or authority. A magician will use what? A magic wand. He's trying to make you believe that he has power over certain things. He can use the magic wand to make a rabbit come out of a hat or something like that. But then we look at a scepter. And literally, in just about every civilization on the planet who's had a king or some sort of lord reign over them, the symbol of his power has been in a staff or a rod or a scepter of some kind. So it represents authority. Think of, um, think of a staff. A staff. Who carries a staff? Shepherds do. Why? They have authority over the sheep. They can use that staff to kind of move them along a little bit. Or that staff usually has a crook on the end of it. What's that for? That's for grabbing sheep and bringing them back into the fold. And basically, whoever's holding the staff is the one in charge of the sheep. And you'd never see sheep holding the staff. Never do. That's for the shepherd. So the rod represents authority. Now, think about this, this symbol of the snake and the rod. Because remember, we're going to look at it from God's point of view, from God's side, Jesus being the rod. We flip it upside down, and here we have the Antichrist. The rod represents authority. You ready? Think of these two snakes and this rod. 
this rod is going to be given authority over whatever it is that looks like this. Hang on. Numbers chapter 17. Let's, if I say the rod represents authority, then I have to use the authority of the Word of God to show you that that's what it means. Numbers chapter 17, verse 6. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece for each prince one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And look at verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against who? The rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. And Moses did so as the Lord commanded him, so did he. Let's break this down. Let's break the symbolism of it down. Here we have the, the princes of Israel, and they're murmuring. They're complaining. They don't like how Moses is leading them. They want, some of them want to go back. And you know how they were all through the wilderness. I don't know why God put up with them. It's like kids in the back of the car on a long road trip, okay? You just can't wait to get there. So they start actually going, well, Moses, who, who put you in charge? What makes you think you can rule over us? What makes you think that Aaron's got to be the high priest? What, what makes you think this way? And Moses said, well, I'll tell you what, let's do it this way. Let's let God decide who's going to be in charge. Moses was meek. You could learn a lesson from that, people. All the bickering and arguing that you try to have with people so that you can try to assert your will or your way over them or you can try to be more right than they are, why don't you just back up and let God have it? Okay? So anyway, here we have, and there's, the numbers here are pretty cool. We have 12 rods brought before the people. Now, remember something. There was actually not just 12 tribes living around the tabernacle in the wilderness. There's 13 of them. You had the half-tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim in around the tabernacle, each one having their own standard, their own rod. They were both from Joseph, but they were divided in two. The Levites actually didn't have one of those places around um, the tabernacle. They lived in amongst them, even in, in the nation of Israel. They, had, they could live anywhere they wanted to, but they had to come back and do their service. They were a different, God had set them aside. And this is what he's showing here through Aaron, who was a Levite priest. So I think there was not just 12 rods here with Aaron's in the pile. I think there was 13 here. And this kind of makes sense. I want you to think about it. You have 12 disciples, but then you have Jesus, the Savior, in the midst of them. So now what do you have? You have 13, all right? Who's in charge of this whole group? Well, it's not Peter, and it's not, um, it's not Bartholomew, and it's not uh, Thomas, and it's not any of these others. It's, the, it's Jesus. He is the one who is the rod his rod buds out. He's given new life. Here's a rod. You know what it is? It's essentially it's a dead stick. But what happens? God resurrects this dead stick of Aaron, and it buds, and it blossoms, and it even has, and this all happened overnight, by the way, has almonds hanging on it, all right? So they bring out the rods the next day. Everybody's looking at their rods, and then Moses brings Aaron's rod out and says, see, this is Aaron's rod, and you all know it is because everybody left their mark on it. This is Aaron's rod. God said he's the one in charge. It's the Levi. It's Moses. It's Aaron. He's the one that's, that's in charge. Even Paul talked about what was in the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod that budded because God, Moses, Moses put it in there as a token to Israel saying, Aaron's in charge. Aaron's the high priest. He's in charge. Moses is in charge here. All right, so you kind of understand that a little bit. All right, so the rod represented authority. Now we're going to read it. Isaiah chapter 11. I, this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Uh, I'm actually preaching a series on Sunday morning on the seven spirits of God, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 11. 
Isaiah 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, just like Aaron's rod that budded. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. These are the seven spirits of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. These are the seven spirits of God that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. So we notice that this, this rod, this rod is Jesus. We know that. The branch, all right? This is Jesus Christ, and he has the seven spirits of God. Let's flip that upside down. Now we have the Antichrist, the beast. What is it about him that's seven? You got it, Revelation 13. He had seven heads. I believe that represents seven spirits. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, God told the Israelites that he was going to send them into the land of Canaan, and he mentioned all the nations that were in there. There was exactly seven. In fact, God said, seven nations that are stronger and mightier than you, and I'm going to put them down and give you their kingdom. I think it's like the opposite of the seven spirits of God. In the teaching of the kundalini, you've heard me talk about that before, right? The kundalini, okay? It's not just an Italian dish. This is something that some people do. And what is it about? It's about a serpent that rises up like this. You're through seven chakras, okay? When it gets into Indian mysticism and even Hebrew mysticism, it's hard for us Westerners to figure this, out, figure this out because we have all these weird words that we're going, I don't know what a chakra is. Some of the words, is, as I'm doing research on Eastern mysticism, I'm reading articles from Wikipedia. I look at those words and they're about that long and I just go, mm, that thing, and I keep reading. And then it's that thing there and I have no idea how to pronounce that. All right? Thank God I don't have to know that in order to be saved forever and ever. Amen? All right? But anyway, seven chakras. They say these, these energy points are inside of your body, and there's seven of them, and the serpent passes through those seven ones on a little journey. Here's what Manley Hall said about it in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. He said, a hint concerning the unfoldment of spiritual understanding according to the secret science of the mysteries is found in the story of Aaron's rod that budded and also in Wagner's great opera Tannhauser where the budding staff of the Pope signifies the unfolding blossoms upon the sacred rod of the mysteries the spinal column dun, dun, dun. Oh, we're getting close to something now. We're going to understand something here a little bit. Here's this rod, and it's got a snake winding upwards in it. And Manley Hall, who was no dear friend of Bible Christianity, I'll tell you, but what he did was he went and he examined just about every religious idea in the world. You know what he basically said? There is no new thing under the sun. What all the mystery cults, were, were celebrating or worshiping or devoted to back thousands of years ago. It's the same religious stuff that they're doing right now. And he basically said they're all talking about one great big gigantic secret. If you want to know what the secret teachings of all ages is about, it's about the Antichrist and how he's going to be revealed. Although it's using it or it's teaching it in occult secret symbolic language. That language is what the Bible is the key to unlock those secrets and tell us what these things are all about. I'm going to show you a picture probably some of you are familiar with. Here's another quote from Manley Hall, Secret Teachings. The staff of the hermit is knowledge, which is man's main and only enduring support. Sometimes the mystic rod is divided by knobs into seven sections, a subtle reference to the mystery of the seven sacred centers along the human spine. Check that out. Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page lived in 
um, Alistair Crowley's Bolskine House on the uh, banks of Loch Ness, where there's a beast rising up out of the water every now and then there. You don't think Alistair Crowley figured that out? That's why, that's why he built it there. Alistair Crowley built this house and he oriented it a certain way, built it a certain way so he could do rituals there to get in touch with these alien demons, these devils that he was trying to get in touch with, all right? Jimmy Page buys his house, he moves in there because he wants that magic that Crowley had. All of a sudden, he's finding himself writing words to a song and he's saying, that wasn't me writing that. Something just took over my pen. I'm writing the words to what song was it? Stairway to Heaven. You see, on the album cover of Stairway to Heaven, they feature what essentially is a tarot card symbol. It's called the Hermit. The Hermit is holding a lamp which has the uh, hexagon in it, has a hexagram in it. Triangle pointing up, triangle pointing down. That's the light in there. If you look at it closely enough, you'll see it. Okay? Look at the tarot card of the Hermit. The artwork matches the tarot card. He's got the lantern in one hand. What's he got in the other hand? He's got the rod. What is that rod? That rod is the Antichrist. And think about it. Think about the connection here between Kundalini, you have the snake, and it's going up the sacred rod with the seven chakras in it, which is the human spine. And what was this song called? Stairway to Heaven. She is buying, you know who she is? Mystery Babylon the Great. She is buying your stairway to heaven. See, that concept and that religion is the exact opposite of what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. Did you learn something today? Kind of makes sense now, doesn't it? Now watch this. Here are depictions of what Kundalini is all about. With all the sacred centers, the seven chakras, and it looks like a serpent or two is going up the, how many bones in the human spinal column? 33 going up the seven sections or the seven chakras. Uh, Wikipedia says this. I had to look. I finally decided I'm going, what it really is a chakra. I mean, I kind of understand the idea that they say it's seven energy points that are inside your body. People, don't, don't fall for this stuff. Don't fall for this stuff. Can I, can I throw something else in here? I don't want to make anybody mad. I really don't. I love you. But the first time I heard this, it didn't sound right. Somebody was trying to get me to... I don't know, take some kind of potion or herbal thing or something like that. And I'm not against that. God put this stuff on the earth and let's use it and see what happens. But they said, now if you'll do this, this will release inside of you the natural healing energies that your body has in there. And I went, can you do me a favor? Can you show me where in the Bible that it says that my body has healing energies that are locked up that if I want to um, if I want to feel better if I want to get rid of diabetes or whatever I need to do something that releases them if you can show me that in the Bible I'll believe it where did you get that teaching from where did you get that idea that doctrine that inside my body are that all the healing energy that I need but it's all locked up where did you get that? You didn't get it from God. And I wasn't mean to anybody. I try not to be mean to people when it comes to this stuff because anybody can be misled, including me. So I try to say, I want you to think about it. Where did you hear this? Where did you hear it from? Did you read it in the Bible? Did you see it on some internet website? Or did you read some book about it? Who wrote that book? What was their training? What was their background? Because ultimately, the idea that inside of our body are these little healing orbs or these energy centers that are locked up, and if we release them, then our body can heal itself. That didn't come from God. It didn't come from the Bible. It came from the doctrine of Kundalini. The seven chakras are what these things are all about. They're like little, they call them energy points. Let me show you what Wikipedia said they are. Chakras are energy points or nodes in the subtle body. The subtle body is like the occult hidden body that's inside of you. It's really like a picture of the Antichrist or something. Their name derives from the Sanskrit word for wheel, but in the yogic context, a better translation of the word is vortex or whirlpool. I want you to think of 
symbol that we've talked about, the sacred spiral. That's what these chakras are. They say that they are portals to like the God world. That's where you get the energy from. You're, are you getting this? They're saying that you have these, these portals, these stargates, seven of them inside of your body. And if you can open up, if you can get the serpent to go up through these energy points and open up all of those portals, then good, then this healing energy is going to be released and you're going to have this, this massive third eye opening thing. Stay, people stay away from this stuff. It's not right. They're teaching you something that I think is going to get you in a lot of trouble one of these days. All right. By the way, I think, I think these seven chakras are not just like subtle body energy points. I think they're devils. Take a look at Mark chapter 16. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Luke 8, 2 says the same thing. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. You know what I think? You know what I think? I think Mary Magdalene practiced kundalini. I can't prove that. I think she did. I think these seven chakras, what they call these energy, these wheels or whirlpools, circles, what do witches do? They draw a circle because they have to be in the circle in order for this magic thing, for the elements to come together and for the magic to work. I think that Mary Magdalene may have practiced some version of this seven chakra awakening thing, whether it was kundalini yoga or some other thing that was in place in her life. Clearly, clearly she had seven devils. That's what I think these chakras are. And I think people who practice yoga, tantric fornication, any of these mystical um, Eastern rituals, Shakti pot, things like that, where they hit you on the forehead and now you can have this spiritual experience. Think about it, slain in the spirit. I think people who practice these things, yoga, kundalini, awareness, I think they are opening themselves up to seven devils, just like Mary Magdalene did. And Mary Magdalene came to Jesus and Jesus set her free from her seven chakras, from all her witchcraft that she used to be a part of. He took those seven devils, those chakras, and he cast them out of her. She don't have them anymore on the inside of her. She had Jesus on the inside of her. Oh, I love that. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, considering all that, we look at passages now that that um, sort of show the connection between the rod and God's judgment against the wicked. Isaiah chapter 5. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Stop. Stop right here. The whole idea of Eastern thought and the yin-yang symbol. It's a circle. It's got like a white teardrop on one side and a black teardrop on the other, and it's got a little black circle in the white one and a white circle in the black one. It's the idea that in everything that's good, there is a little bad, and everything that's bad, there is a little good. That's what they want you to believe. That's what Isaiah 5 was telling you. He's telling you, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You know what John said about God? God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Wow. I think the Bible just answered that question. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, think of the yin-yang symbol, and light for darkness, there it is again, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Stop right here. One of my favorite Chinese foods Sweet and sour chicken. Tastes good, doesn't it? Because they use sour, they use a little citrus and vinegar, then they sweeten it up with sugar and maybe some honey or whatever it is, all right? Boy, it is yummy, isn't it? But 
sweet and sour sauce, sweet and sour chicken is based upon the yin-yang principle. It's a sauce. Is it sweet? Yeah, but it's also sour, bitter. That put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Now, I'm not saying that if you eat Chinese food, you're going to hell. We're not defiled by what goes in our body. Now, anyway, he says this. There's a woe to them who call evil good and good evil, who put light for darkness and darkness for light, who look at traditional marriage between a man and woman and say, that's just, that is so wrong. You two men will live happily ever after. That's calling darkness light and light darkness. That's going on all around us, people. People are accepting the worst perversions that have ever been in the world as being good things. And those people who just try to live good, clean, decent lives, now nah, we're, we're hate mongers, we're bigots, we're something wrong with us. Society needs to get rid of us. There's a woe coming because that's how most of the world now sees Bible Christianity. So here's what he said in verse 25. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Then he says in verse 26, And he will lift up an ensign to the, all the nations from far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary, nor stumble among them. None shall shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. Now watch this, verse 28. Whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion, and they shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and, and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. Did you see that? He said their wheels, that's what the word chakra means. Their wheels like a whirlwind. Think about it. That's what those chakras or those devils are. And Eastern mysticism and yoga and kundalini says, oh, you want those on the inside of you. That's what you want. Mm -mm. God said, that's bad. God said, watch out for that. And according to Ezekiel chapter 1, re remember when we study spirits in the Bible, God gives us a, a sort of an image of what it is they look like, how they appear. I mean, we have some that look like men and some that look like a, an ox or a lion or an eagle. Uh, but in Ezekiel chapter 1, remember how he described part of their body? Wheels. So I think that this woe that God is describing to those who call good evil and evil good, their wheels like a whirlwind, I think that is the Bible's way of explaining that the nation that comes from afar, who has a fierce countenance and whose language they cannot understand. I think these are spirits. I think the fourth kingdom is all about spirits dominating over planet earth. Because in Ezekiel chapter 1, he's describing these cherubs, these cherubims, as having like wheels and circles and rings around the wheels, Ezekiel 1, 19. And when the living creatures went, there, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, those stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And later on it talks about the wheels and rings. And it hit me one day, wait a minute. I've seen that before. Let me show you this picture. There it is right there. There is, there is always in the Bible a connection between the planetary objects and the celestial lights, the stars, and spirits and angels. They're always connected together. This particular planet happens to be the planet Saturn. 
And remember, if you don't know this, Saturn has at its North Pole this gigantic hexagon at the top of it formed by clouds and no one in the universe knows how it got there or why it's still there. No one can explain it. Astronomers look at it and go, wow, that's interesting. Why is it there? We have no idea. It just doesn't look natural. I think, what's well, going to sound weird, I think that what they're seeing here is the way that we would perceive and see one of these spiritual beings. Because Saturn, if you remember from some other videos we've done, get um, King James Code where we talk about the number seven. I go into a little bit more detail about this and I talk about the wheels and the rings and Saturn and so on. All of the ancients had it in their mind that there were seven planetary objects which they said were seven spirits or seven gods or seven angels or seven divine beings or in the case of Eastern mysticism, seven chakras, which are wheels, which are whirlpools, that Fibonacci spiral thing. This is a picture, I think, of devils, spirits. The, they all had this idea that these seven planets, starting with the moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the one with the wheel inside the wheel, was always number seven. Manly Hall makes the connection about the seven chakras being a representation of the seven planets, which are the seven spirits or the seven angels or the seven divine beings. Simply put, I think these seven devils that were driven out of Mary Magdalene, these are the seven spirits that represent, or seven devils, that represent each of the heads of the beast. See, here's something interesting. When studying the seven spirits of God, I noted that the Bible says in, in, in uh, the Bible says that Jesus has the seven spirits of God. He's the rod that has them. In Revelation chapter 5, it specifically says that the lamb who is, who is able to open the book, that lamb has seven eyes and he has seven horns. You know what those horns look like? You know, like a, a ram's horn or a lamb? It's like a whirlpool. It's that Fibonacci spiral, isn't it? In the image of Christ in Revelation chapter 5, those seven horns, the Bible says those are the seven spirits of God, which we know as the Holy Spirit. Seven spirits, seven different uh, functions of the Holy Spirit, all operating in one. But think of the beast. He's not just seven spirits all operating in one. These are seven different heads in one body. And you know what that kind of gives me the impression of? Who's in charge here? Which one of those heads actually decides what the rest of that body is going to do? You know what I think I see in that? I think I see in the kingdom of the Antichrist that his kingdom is divided. It's separate. It's not all together. And if it's divided, I don't think it's going to stand. Now, there's a couple more things I'm going to show you about this kundalini thing and the, and the connection between the, the rod of Asclepius um, or the, um, the uh, caduceus, the two serpents going up the rod. Here's something that's really interesting. Because in kundalini, they tell you that you have at the base of your spine, which has 33 bones in it, think of 33, 33 levels of Freemasonry, and so on. At the base of your spine, you have this serpent, this beast. He's down in a low part. To, without being vulgar, the base of your spine really is like the nastiest place on the human body. All right? Without, you know, okay, you kind of get where I'm saying. They're saying that's where that serpent is. When you perform the ritual, the serpent rises up out of that place. Now here's something I just I found out here a while back, and I'm going, I'm going to use this somewhere. It fits in here real good since we're talking about the kundalini. At the base of the human spine, there's a section, and it's called the sacrum. Here's a picture of it right here. You see the spine, you see the sacral canal, but see that triangle-shaped bone structure. It's called the sacrum. 
It's an upside down triangle, triangle pointing down. What does the word sacrum mean? Do you know? It's where we get the word sacred from. This word sacrum literally means the holy place, not making that up. So here we, and basically it's down here, so you know what it is. It's not really that holy, is it? That serpent is nothing more than the beast that's down in the pit. And Kundalini is all about getting him to go through the seven gates of hell or the seven layers or the, with the help of the seven spirits or the seven chakras or whatever it is so he can uncoil up the spinal cord and give illumination to mankind. In fact, here's a, here's a perfect picture of it right here. Take a look at this. Here you have the sacrum on the bottom. That represents the lower parts of the earth, hell. And it stinks. Think about it, okay? And then you have the spine, the serpent going up, and then it's going up to what? A triangle up here, which is where the third eye is, the, uh, the pineal gland that gives people supposedly illumination. Actually, it puts them to sleep, which is their version of it. And that matches perfectly the symbolism of the square and the compass, the yin and the yang. Eliphas Levi's uh, hexagram with there's a you know light and darkness and they're fused together. It's basically two triangles that are joined together by the human spine. And that's what the symbol of the rod of Asclepius or the Caduceus represents. It's an occult symbol showing the rise of the kingdom of the Antichrist with his seven heads and the seven devils or whatever that Jesus threw out of Mary Magdalene. Now they're going around looking for everybody else. It's the religion of the Antichrist. That's what it's teaching. And I think the mark of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, has everything to do with, we know it as the second death. They're twofold the child of hell now, now that they've taken that mark. I think it's going to be sold to people all over the world as this is what's going to heal your diseases. That's what I think. That's what I think all these symbols represent. And I think people are going to buy it. I think people are going to fall for it. They're falling for the serpent that's on the rod. Now you say, well, you know, Moses did this and they looked and lived and it was... I'll show you about that next week, all right? I believe the Bible. I sure do. And I'm going to show you from the Bible where this is wrong, all right? God bless. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed this so far. Maybe you've learned a little bit something. Maybe you've been reminded of something you'd studied before. Keep studying your Bible, all right? It's been good to be with you today. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.